substitution this morning. Uh, so Terry is, is watching at home, and Terry's probably yelling into the screen, Gabe, tell him to have a seat. But that's okay, we get by. Um, we're entering into a new series. Uh, we're looking at two chapters in the good book, Exodus 3 and 4, and we're going to be talking about approach. Uh, we're going to be talking about how we approach God, and I'm going to talk about that today. Uh, and twofold, uh, next week, this week, uh, we're talking about approaching God in reverence. And if you don't know what reverence is, good, that's the point of the sermon. We're going to get there. I do want to say that if you just take this sermon alone, you're going to be left hanging a little bit. And so I, I do hope you understand that next week we approach God. The second sermon is going to be approaching God in confidence. But here's the thing, we can't get to approaching God in confidence until we've approached God in reverence. And then finally, uh, our third one is going to be approaching the lost. But when I talk about approach, I've seen a lot of approaches here this morning. Uh, we had the, the prayer partner meeting, and, and you see that a child happening to approach an adult, or an adult you know, kind of approaching a child like, hey, pretty sure I know who you are. Uh, at the same time, I've really enjoyed the children taking the opposite approaches. I know this is wrong. How close can I get to approaching it before my parents snag me uh, by the back of the neck? This is fun to watch, okay? I do know with Valentine's Day coming up on Tuesday, gentlemen, Valentine's Day, Tuesday, that there is some approaching uh, that has happened for some of you in the past. See, it's fun to be beyond this, but some of you, you know what it's like to be just like, why am I... Why am I so bent out of shape? It's because there's someone you want to approach, but there's a gap between you, all right? And, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that next week, but, the, but I like um, the concept of approaching, and this is, this is where I go currently, that there was a point in our nation's history where people sat around and they looked at the sky and they watched the birds flying by. That rhymed? You're welcome. And they thought, how do I get there? Okay, and so some of you know some of these things, but, but this is what we did. This was the approach. <clears throat> we were just guessing. We thought, let's, let's see what happens. Let's use some rocket fuel. Let's see what we can do. We got to fly. We want to fly. Blast off. Let's go. And that, that's a picture of some of your dating lives right there. Like, let's go, and they just, pfft. now Now here's another approach. This is, I like this one. I like this one. Some guy looked at a ladder and was like, I bet that could fly. It didn't even get off the ground. Didn't even get off the ground. And let's be honest, there's some of us that a lot of the things we want to approach never leaves the ground. There's a second approach, Okay. I am firmly convinced there are three places where the most prayer per capita are lifted. It's a church building, it's a college testing area, and it is an airplane, okay? Now, here's the thing. At some point, we, we started flying. I didn't want to break that for you, but there's airplanes, okay? We, we can fly. But at some point, you realize there was a guy that got into the air and then had the thought, oh, no, what do I do? about landing. Because if you look at a lot of the original, there was no regard for how you were going to land the thing. And so you just kind of, what, what just happened was a guy pulling out a rubble, but you just were excited to get this thing in the air. You're just like, this is great. I am so happy. Oh, what do I do now is the thought going on. Bam. And here's the best part. Watch this guy's reaction. Oh, I didn't see it. See if it stops right there in the end. He celebrates. He gets out and jumps up. I may have cut it off too short, but he's excited. He's excited. He got air and then celebrated the fact that he was alive. There it is. Oh, we're so close. Okay. Anyway, he celebrates. Wherever you are sitting right now, there is some different things for you to approach. Some of you, you've got some, some conversations you have to approach, and they're not good ones. Like, you want to avoid them. You're like, I don't, I don't want to have that approach. Some of you, you've got some stuff coming up Monday that if you don't approach come Friday, you're going to tell us about the pink slip you got, okay? That there's some things that got to happen. But I want to a moment talk about how we approach God, and I want to use the example that we've got in Exodus of Moses, okay? 
Now, as we walk through this, I'm going to stop from time to time. One day, Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro. I'm reading through the New Living Translation. If you're turned in Exodus 3, you'll see some different words coming up. Jethro was the priest of Midian. He led the flock, Moses did, into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. This is going to be renamed Sinai later. Some of your translations may say the mountain of Horeb. And guess what? Guess what we can pull from the word Horeb? Horrible. Okay? This area was known not only as the wilderness, which we just came out of, but it was a wasteland. Okay? Have you guys been to those areas? Like, what? where am I? This place is horrible. Okay? This is where Moses is at. You don't expect much to happen in those areas. And then this is what happens in verse 2. There the angel of the Lord appeared. Now, here's, God does something awesome. God shows up a lot in places that it is unexpected. God raises a man of God in a town called Nazareth. With, if, at that time, that was their slogan on their license plate was Nazareth. Could anything come from here? Jesus does. There comes the angel into this horrible place. The angel appears to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Some of you have your Bibles open, so you know what's coming next. Some of you know this story, but can you imagine if just that was it? If Moses was just like, ah, all right, and just kept on tending to his sheep. See, if there's no approach, there's nowhere for us to go next, but let's watch Moses' approach. Moses had an awareness. He stared in amazement, and though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn this is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? The sheep did not reply. They did not give him an answer. So he decided, I must go see it. I'll pause for a second right here. Some of you guys and some of your coworkers, some of your neighbors, some of your friends, they have seen God. They have seen and heard of Jesus Christ. There's an awareness but there's never an approach. And we've got to understand, it is not an awareness. It is the approaching of Jesus Christ that we have to have in our lives. Okay? Some of us, we'll get the t-shirt, we'll celebrate, but we've never approached. And we've got to understand, there must be an approach, and there must be a continual approach. And we'll talk about that. Moses has stopped in amazement. I've got to go see it. We're moving forward. Verse 4. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses. Here I am, Moses replied. Oh, just think, of, just think of how awesome. Just pause for a second. You are bored out of your mind, tending some sheep in the middle of no man's land. And all of a sudden, you just see a flaming fire that's not consuming a bush. I've got to see this. And then, I, I can't articulate what the voice of the Lord would sound like, but I have a feeling it'd be awesome. And so there is something that is amazing by his sight, something amazing by his ears, and just this excitement of, here I am. And just this awe factor happening right here. Here I am. Moses is in this place completely open. All this. Here I am. Do not come any closer. I just woke two of you up. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. He says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I'm going to pause for a second. Take off your sandals for where you're standing on holy ground. I'm going to ask you to do something. Take off your shoes. I hear it. I'm hearing groaning. I'm hearing complaining. You know what? Some of you already have your shoes off. Some of you, it's just way too easy. You know what I'm talking about. Those of you that wore the loafers, like you were prepped, but you've always been prepped. Some of you are like, listen, I wore the double strap boots. Some of you are like, Rob, it took me 20 minutes to bend down and tie these things this morning. I ain't doing it. Here's, here's what's cool. I can't force you to do anything. We're not that kind of church. That's a cult, okay? I can't force you to do anything. But I'm asking for a moment. I'm asking for a moment. Take off your shoes. 
okay? Take off your shoes. I, I'm fully convinced the reason Terry is not here is just by simple intuition is he knew I was going to force him to take his boots off. All right. It feels weird, doesn't it? This is not, this is not normal. This is kind of different. A little different. Okay. Take off your sandals. This is who I am, God says. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was too afraid to talk to God. Do you see what just happened? He went from a, this is awesome, to oh my goodness, in a covering of his face. Why taking the shoes off? In that time, in that place, shoes represented filth. Shoes represented sin. Shoes were, were just dirty. They were not something you carried into a house. The tradition of taking your shoes off outside of home, where does it come from? It comes from this time period. Okay? To come into a holy placement, you cannot be filthy. You cannot bring your filth in here. The same thing with the holiness of God. Here's why. The holiness of God and the sinfulness of man, they do not compute. And some of you say, like, are they a magnet where they can't touch ends? No, no, no. The holiness of God just all consumes it. Just gone. Now, here's the thing. The place is holy, not in and of itself. The place is holy because God is present, okay? We're going to see this through the different approach coming up, that the ground is now holy, not before God was there, but because God has said, this is now holy. Why is our Bible holy? Because God has said. It's not the, it's not the fake leather on it. Mine's falling apart. It's not the way the text is. It's because God has said. It, he has imparted the holiness. Moses removes his shoes, comes forward, and he has now approached God in reverence. I want to explain reverence in this way, that it is twofold. It is the here I am moment, and it is the oh no, and it's simultaneous. That for us to come forward to God in reverence and approach God in reverence, it's two parts equally entwined, it is an awe, it is an amazement, it is oh my, and an oh no. Reverence is awe and fear. I want to say this, some of you, you know the Bible, and you're going to the first, there is no fear in love. It's actually out of 1 John 4, where dad read this morning. Some of you go, hold up, Rob, I've, I've, I've read other parts. There is no fear. I want you to take that thought. If you have a pocket, just stick it in there. It's coming up next week, okay? We're going to get there. But for right now, and I'm, I'm going to lay it out, you have got to be in a place of awe and fear. And just for a moment, to see what is reverence, Moses stared in amazement. And when Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look. When was the last time you came to God in reverence? Just think about this for a second. Because here's the thing. We'll, we'll come to God with our requests. Um, we don't use this terminology, but basically if we were to, to translate it, it'd be God, gimme, gimme, gimme. We come to God expecting results. This is the way we'll approach him. Hey, I, uh, I treat him the same way as I do the ATM machine. If I push some buttons, stuff's going to come out. And, and sometimes we'll come to God because we're about to partake in refreshments. They almost start with ours. Normally I'd say food. But we come to God and, to take some refreshments. So, hey, thanks for this food that I'm gorging on. But when was the last time you came to God in reverence? Just overwhelmed by who he is and overwhelmed by the fear of who he is. Now, here's the thing. Some of you got your shoes off. Some of you quietly slipped them back on already. If you were to come to me and say, hey, I haven't taken my shoes off in, in three days, I'd go, what is wrong with you? If you were to come to me and say, hey, I've had my shoes on for three weeks straight, I'd go, that's disgusting. I am sure there is some gross nonsense inside those shoes right now. If you were to come to me and say, man, it's been since June last year, I'd be like, I'm pretty sure that, that those feet are going to be sweaty and gross and disgusting. See, here's the thing. Even if we just say, hey, I spent the night in my shoes, we look at each other and go, dude, that's not, that's not right. That's kind of weird. 
why is it that we can honestly say, I haven't really prayed to God in reverence in a couple days? Why is it we could, we could openly and honestly admit, I really have not come to God in a place of reverence in a couple weeks? How many of us, the last time we have really said, oh my God, and oh my God, in prayer? And you guys know what I'm talking about. You guys have had those prayers where you're like, I'm a, I'm a dead man. I can't even talk to you right now. When was the last time we really approached God in reverence? I want to tell you one of the reasons why I think we don't approach God in reverence. I think, and, and we talked about this Wednesday night, Revelation 13, 6 says the devil, what he wants to do is he wants to corrupt, he wants to blaspheme, he wants to slander our understanding of God, of God's name, of God's dwelling place, heaven, and those people that will dwell with him, his people. And so what, what I think we need as a congregation, what I think we need as people the body of Christ, we need this right here. I believe it's called a neuralizer or, or something like that. I don't know. And you guys seen Men in Black? You guys know? Okay, so the little stick he's holding, do you know what it does? He says, look into the light. It erases your memory. Just pfft. Here's the deal. And I am guilty of this, and I need this just as well. This isn't like the preacher's looking down upon you going, you need this. I think we have got some thoughts in our mind about who God is, and they have been handed, and maybe, yeah. maybe they've been passed along for a while, but they've come not from the divine God himself, but the devil slips some stuff in there. Some of us, God can be a little bit more hokey than holy. Some of us, we've got these images of a cartoon cloud and God just chilling up there. He's got like this cloud lazy boy recliner. Uh, it, our view has been changed. So what if, what if for a moment we could wipe all that out and we let God define who he is? Do you realize when we ask God, when people ask, who are you? He says, I am. I am. I am not what you say I am. I am not what they have told you I am. I am. And I want us to understand briefly, if we're going to approach God in reverence, maybe we need to go back and let the great I am tell us who he really is. I know it hurts. It means you've got to read. You've got to listen to the Bible. All right. Here's where I want to go. If you've got your Bibles open to Isaiah 6, we've cleared some memory. Let's, let's take a look at who God is for a second. Because there is a place in Isaiah 6 where, where Isaiah gets to view the Lord. Now, here's, we don't know if this is a vision of Isaiah viewing the Lord or if Isaiah actually gets a glimpse of what's going on. But we do know that no one can see God unless they are in the holiness and the righteousness of God because we'll just be all consumed by how great God is. But in Isaiah 6, in verse 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died... I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Pause for a second to put this in context. Uzziah would have been an awesome king. He would have been a king that gave stability. He would have been a king that people are like, this is good. He has died. There is instability. There is an unknown. There is what's going to happen. And Isaiah gets to see who's really on the throne. Who is really on the throne? It's God. And listen, we get freaked out by this little porty potty of a, of a throne that's up on Pennsylvania Avenue. Like, we're so, so concerned about this little throne up there. Well, who, it depends on who's on it is how we feel. And we get all out of sorts. We're like, there's little white balls floating in the air. What are, what's going on? What are we going to do? We, should we shoot them down? I don't know. And we get so consumed about what's going on on this little teeny throne. And, and, and God say, listen, it's about me and it's my throne. It says, and the train of his robe filled the temple. What does that mean? A robe, the length of the robe showed the prominence. It showed the divineness of those at that time. And to say his robe filled the entire room. Can you imagine if I was actually wearing like a, a priestly garment and it just kind of went down and it just wrapped all the way around the room? How ridiculous that would be. But if you looked at that as how prominent someone was, not me, look at God be like, oh my goodness. Verse 2, above him stood the seraphim. These are angels. 
each had six wings. Okay, I'm going to try and work with the visual here. We've got angels with six wings. Watch what they do. With two, they covered their face. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. What is happening here? God, I'm taking two of these wings and I'm covering my feet because I'm dirty. I'm covering my feet because I am not holy. I am covering my feet because I know that I am not in the ability to be in your presence because of who I am. And with two, I'm covering my face because I can't even see you because of how great you are. I can't even, I can't even take in your glory. And with two, they're flying to be close to him. And they called out to one another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled of his glory. Verse 4, the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. Think about this. There's some people that have understood what it means for things to shake in Turkey. That they have felt the pain and, and of the shaking. And to hear the voice of God can cause that. The voice of called, the house was filled with smoke, and he said, and I said, Isaiah says, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. In verse 6, then one of the seraphim, he flew to me. Isaiah, at this moment, it's got the head bowed, the face covered, go, I'm dead. And one of those angels flew to him, having in his hand a burning coal they had taken with tongues from the altar. He touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. The only reason we can stand in front of the Lord with our heads lifted is because of the one who has touched us and has allowed our sins to be atoned for. Here's the thing. A lot of us just want to willy-nilly be in the place of God and do it separate and apart from who the man of Jesus Christ is. And I want us to understand, not just today, but every single day, we walk through that process of reverence going, He is an amazing God, and I don't deserve to be close. Next week, we're going to talk about the confidence we ha can have and that confidence that's in Christ. How awe-inspiring is God? I, I, I want to touch on the airplane. There's a comedian, Bill Burr, and I can only watch his when he talks when he's on late-night shows because everything else is too much garbage. But on one of the late-night shows, he's, he's just slouched there next to Conan O'Brien, and this is how you get a comedian to talk. You just say, hey, what's up? And the comedian will just talk. And he says, well, on my flight here, the guy sitting next to me was sitting there with his, his iPad and, go, and looked over me and goes, Puh, the Wi-Fi's down. And Bill just sits there for a second. He goes, how ridiculous is that? We are in a steel tube flying at hundreds of miles per hour, thousands of feet in the air. Like we're being taken from one destination to another in this giant metal tube hurling through the air. And this guy's grumpy because he cannot connect to the World Wide Web through a wireless connection inside of the big steel bird tube in which we are flying across the country. Pretty ridiculous. See, we can get so accustomed to simple things that we lose our awe. And I think part of the problem is we don't go and gawk at all that God has done. When's the last time you just thought about the moon? When's the last time you looked into the stars? When's the last time you saw a beautiful sunset? And the colors, there, there's so many colors, you can't even describe them. That the color palette God puts on display is just mind-blowing. And to think, here we are on this big ball, it's a rock, but it's got water. And then if you go inside, there's magma. Whoa, crazy. And we're just floating in the middle of nothing and not only is it this nothingness we are floating in, but God's got us spinning at the exact right motion in the exact right place that we don't just combust upon heat being too close to the sun or freeze from being too far away. And not only is he just suspending us and rotating us in the midst of nothing, that nothing we call space is endless. 
and it just keeps going and going. So we, as people that are excited to learn, we shoot up rockets. And we're like, let's just see how far this thing will go. And it just keeps going and going. And do you realize in the next five years, ten years, in the next lifetime, we will find more and more of this great expanse. And I think there's a place for us to show, God, you are awesome. When was the last time you just sat and, and, and kind of thought about all God has doing? To not only think that he has taken and knitted molecules to make a man, but not only that, that there is molecules so small that, that they're like passing through us right at this given moment. And not only that, but that he has neuroreceptors inside the brain that a little child, in the midst they feel pain, they seek their mother and father and seek to be held. And that God has got all this. When's the last time we really just sat in the awe of what God is doing? When was the last time when we just crossed our arms and were grumpy about something and realized this is, this is Wi-Fi on an airplane? This is ridiculous. There should be a place to just be excited about all God is doing. And you can't approach God in reverence if you are not awe-inspired. And I think for some of us, we need to get to back to a place of amazement. Get back to a place where you just go, this is, this is awesome, God. But frankly, a lot of us, we've got more complaints. We've got more regrets. We've got more things we want answers to rather than just being awe-inspired. And the other half is fear. And I want to turn some place real quick. If you've got your Bibles, Matthew 10. If not, I will read it to you. In Matthew 10... Uh, starting in verse 28, we've got Jesus speaking, and he's going to say something, because I'm talking about fear, and he kind of discounts me right from the get-go. He says, don't be afraid. Well, okay, let's see what he's talking about. In verse 28, he says, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. Watch this. They cannot touch your soul. He's saying right here, fear only God. And I want to stop for a second. You got, you got two options. You can fear God and fear absolutely nothing else. Or if you don't have a fear of God, you will find so many things to be fearful of. Are you gathering that? That you wonder why some of you here, you can walk with your heads high through just terrible situations. It's because you fear God. And in that fear, you recognize he's got it. But a lot of you, you fear God at a moment and then, then kind of it's faded. Come back to the place of reverence. Come back to the place of fearing God. Going on in verse 28. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. What's the price of two sparrows? One copper coin, but not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the, and the very hairs on your head are all numbered. And that number is higher and lower depending on who you are. So then he comes back and he says, don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. And I want to watch right now where he goes here, because you're going to see some awe and you're going to see some fear. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Are you catching that? Everyone who acknowledges me in their lifetime on earth, everyone who acknowledges them publicly, Jesus Christ is sitting next to the Holy of Holies. He's sitting next to the throne. He's sitting next to the Almighty God. And he's going, I know him. Think about that first. How awesome is that? Is that your name, if you have acknowledged Jesus Christ, is in the ear of God Almighty. Because in this life, if you go, Jesus, I believe you are the Lord. I want you. I desire you as my Savior. That in the Holy of Holies, in that Almighty Kingdom, there is a mighty God with the man of Christ right next to him. Go, Aaron Dimmel. I know him, God. How awesome is that? Do you know what's easier than taking off your shoes? Acknowledging Jesus Christ. Do you know what's easier than, than removing, physically removing filth? Whether you do it with a zest bar of soap or it's just taking off the boots, is acknowledging Jesus Christ. 
think for a second just how awesome that is that your name is in heaven on the lips of Jesus Christ. And all you had to do was pause long enough in your place. Just go, it's all you, Jesus. It's you. It's you. Now, I know that there are some of you, like, I can't say that because of who I am. I can't say that because of what I've done. Do you know my backstory? Do you know the people I have backstabbed? Do you know the stuff I have drank? Do you know the stuff I have put in my body? Do you know the way I have treated other people? I'm telling you, you can try and take all that off. You can treat those like boot strings and try and untie them and try and take them off. But he says this, if you acknowledge me, I'm acknowledging you. And if that doesn't put the uh, tingling in your arms, if that doesn't make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, how awesome is it to realize we can come before an almighty God because we proclaim his name? Hold on for a second, because that's awesome. That's all inspiring. Here comes the fear. That was verse 32. Look at verse 33. But everyone who denies me here on earth. I will also deny before my Father in heaven. And if that doesn't put some fear in you, I don't know what else will. Everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. And if some of you right now, you're like, you know what? I'm acknowledged and I have, will continue to acknowledge the Lord. And there's this place of comfort knowing your name is with God. But there should be a place of fear when you think of the loved ones around you. That then by their actions, by the things they do, it's, it's a denial. It's a nah, nah. Sermon coming up in a couple weeks is how do we approach those people? But we can't get there unless we ourselves recognize the reverence in which we are to approach God. Listen, be awe-inspired. Carry a healthy dose of fear. Hebrews 5, this is why I tell you reverence is important. In one verse, I can, put, I can point us to the, the importance of reverence in approaching God. In the days of his flesh... Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And Jesus was heard because of his reverence. Are you catching that? Jesus wasn't heard because of his birthright. Jesus wasn't heard because he shared in this divine triune process with God in this persona with God. He was heard because that he had an awe and a fear of who God was. If Jesus has to approach God for his prayers to be heard and reverence, I've got a feeling this one applies to us as well. That there needs to be a place of awe and fear. If you've got your Bibles, Hebrews 12, I'm going to poke and prod for a second. There's some beautiful stuff here. Hebrews 11, if you know your Bible, it's the Hall of Fame of Faith. The writer of Hebrews is going to talk about all these great people by faith. And then he jumps in to Hebrews 12 and he talks about the Sabbath of all things, a Sabbath rest. He talks about how we as a people of God who can have faith can have rest. And, and, but at the same time, there's this understanding. Excuse me, I'm in the wrong place here. Let me get my footing down. There's a place of his love, a place to listen, a place to come before God. And he starts in chapter 12. He says, therefore, since, since we as people of faith are surrounded by people of faith, let's go. He says, let's take off every weight that slows us down, especially sin. You got your shoes off. That's a good thing. Take off the weight that slows us down and let us run with endurance 
the race God has set before us. It doesn't say proclaim one day and then do whatever you want. It says run with endurance the race of faith. How do we do this? I'll tell you this, you're going to trip and fall if you're trying to do it on your own. It says in verse 2, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. He's the champion who initiates, he perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. By joy, he went to the cross. Skip down a few verses. Have you forgotten these encouraging words that God spoke to you as children? He said, my child, he's talking to you. My child, this is from God. My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. And if we're being honest, some of us say, I got Jesus, and then we just do whatever we want. And he is saying, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. Don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes each one he accepts as his child. Listen. Some of you, you, you've aged out of having a father figure over you physically, okay? There's some kids in here, when dad's voice is said, they halt, they stop. There is a healthy amount of fear. Some of us, we just run crazy. And the Lord is trying to speak to us, correct us, and discipline us. And, and we've just thrown wax in the ears, and we're running off wherever we want. Verse 7, as you endure this divine discipline, remember, God's treating you like his children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by their father? God loves you, so there needs to be a healthy manner of fear and respect and reverence. Skipping down to verse 16, there's this call to listen to God. Verse 16, make sure that no one's immoral or godless like Esau. Pause. How do we do that? The only way we can make sure someone is following God, is not living in morality, is to come together as the body of Christ. To interact with one another. Listen, you are saved by Christ. You are saved by Christ. And he gives us the church as his body for our benefit, as our blessing. To understand that there is a place here to chide one another, to poke one another, to go, dude, come on. Let's keep going. Let's run the race. Those of you at home and, and you haven't been back in some time, we want you here. Because you need to tell us where we're not running the race. And we want to be around you. Okay, make, ver, back to verse 16. That was my, that was my mini rant. Listen, listen. No, the, the rant's not over. The rant's still going. The Bible got put down. There is nothing that, that disappoints, frustrates, and breaks the heart of a minister than a wandering sheep. And here's the thing. God knows you. God knows where you are at. But dear God, we want you close with the flock. We want you rubbing shoulders with the flock for your benefit. For your benefit. We want you staying close. Many rain over. Okay, back to the Bible. Verse 16, make sure no one is immoral or godless like Esau. Some of you, you know the name of Esau. You remember your Bible story. Some of you are like, what are we going with Esau? Who traded his birthright as the firstborn son for a single meal. Pause for a second. Birthright for a meal. There is people even today that are trading their eternal life with God for the simplicity of filling their belly right now. We catching that? Okay. You know that afterward, when he wanted his father's blessing, he was rejected. It was too late for repentance even though he begged with bitter tears. It was too late for repentance. It was too late for repentance. Verse 18. You haven't come to a physical mountain. You have not come to a place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom, and whirlwind, as the Israelites did at Mount Sinai. For they heard an awesome trumpet blast, and a voice so terrible that they begged God to stop speaking. Are you hearing that? God, please stop talking. God, please stop talking. 
They staggered back under God's command. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. Moses himself was so frightened at the sight that he said, I am terrified, I am trembling. And yet we treat God in a hokey, howdy-doody manner. Skipping ahead to the last two verses of chapter 12. Since we are receiving a kingdom, here's the deal. When Jesus elbows God and mentions your name, he's mentioning your name because you are a part of his eternal kingdom. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. He burns those boots right up. For our God is a devouring fire. He burns up the sinful. Approach him with fear. Approach him with awe. Think through this for a second. He's speaking to God's people. Since we, since we, the children of God, since we are receiving the kingdom that is unshakable, let us who are in the kingdom, who are his children, be thankful and please God by approaching him in worship with what? Reverence, fear, and awe. For our God is a devouring fire. All right, here's the final tie-in. Here's the final illustration. This is the last bit, and we're done, and I need a drink of water. <clears throat> Do some of you ever wonder why you feel so beat up in life? You guys there? Do some of you ever wonder why is life so hard? We're going to get a, a lesson through Ricky Henderson from a pilot. Okay, this is fun, okay? So Ricky Henderson, all-time stolen base leader. Some of you did not know that. That's why he's holding the base. That was the record breaker. He kept that one. Somewhere it's on his shelf. All-time stolen base leader. But if you watched his form, he ran really low and slid really low. Some of you go back to the memories of the original one that kind of enacted the head first slide. It's Pete Rose. Okay, Ricky always slid, slid head first and he slid real low. If you look at pictures of Pete Rose sliding, like you could, you could almost walk under him. He would run and almost jump in the air to dive head first. Ricky Henderson is asleep on a plane and bam, he's jolted awake. Whoa. Doesn't think much about it. It was just a painful landing. He gets out, goes about his day. The next time Ricky is on a plane, he's awake. And it lands so smooth. Just nothing changes. Nothing moves. And so he comes to the pilot. He's walking out to that big metal bird with no Wi-Fi. He comes to the pilot and he says, yo, what, what, what's up? Why can we hit so hard sometimes? And then other times the landing is just so smooth. And the pilot says, the difference between the landing is your approach. The lower you can arrive, the easier the landing is going to be for you. Some of you wonder why you feel beat up in life. Your approach is a lot smoother if you get low. This is going to make sense in a point here. Some of you have gotten this already. I have to say it again. Some of you are feeling beat up in life. Your approach is going to be a whole lot smoother if you get low. Some of us, we know the Lord, and we have stopped humbling ourselves before the Lord. Some of us, we cry out to the Lord and it's complaints because we are coming to the Lord like Pete Rose. We're just diving in the air and belly smacking. You know what I don't want to do? I don't want to land in a plane at a 90 degree angle. That's not something I want to do. 
But some of us, this is how we approach God. We're just, bam, why does it hurt? Bam, why does it hurt? Because we have stopped humbling ourselves. We have stopped getting into that place and lowering ourselves and saying, you are God and I am not. And here's the thing. We've said that a bunch in this church. You are God, I am not. Not. And if it's just a mantra, if it's just a description of who he is and who we are, and it's not an understanding and description of how we're supposed to approach him, you're a God, and I'm not. You are holy, and I am not. You are worthy of all. God, I'm not. And when we approach God in reverence, things are going to be a whole lot smoother. So we keep that awe of an almighty God, but we watch our approach. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. He's an awesome God. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. He will lift you up. That's what we'll be talking about next week. I want to invite the praise team minus Terry up. As they're coming up, I want to say this. There is a time it will be too late. But that may not necessarily be now. Because we look at the thief on the cross. And on either side of Jesus are two men with two different views of an almighty God. And one of them says, don't you even fear God? You've been sentenced for what you deserve. We deserve this. Do you not fear God? But this man, he hasn't done anything wrong. One of these men next to Jesus acknowledged him. As Lord. And Jesus says, after he acknowledges him, he says, Remember me, Lord, remember me. He said, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. Those of you, you, there was an approach. Keep approaching in reverence. Approach God today. Approach him in reverence. And if you have lost the awe, and if you have lost the fear, come back to the correct approach of the Lord. Take it, guys.